We have the pleasure of welcoming Mark Sanborn today to our interview series, Leaders Hum. I'm Aishwarya Jain from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Hum. People Hum is an end to end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well known names globally every month. And now for our guest. Mark is a world-renowned keynote speaker for over 30 years of experience delivering results. His interests mainly lie in strategy and leadership development. He's the author of seven best-selling books and has consulted for leading multinational organizations. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times and many more. We're so thrilled to have Mark as our guest today. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Good to be with you. Our pleasure. So Mark, you've had an amazing journey with a rich experience of 34 years. Tell us a little bit about your learnings and you know, interesting experiences that you've had along the way. I started in sales and marketing before I became a full-time speaker and author. And there's two things that kind of stick out to me. The first are the experiences I had because I've had a lot of unusual and interesting experiences like speaking on the beach in Hawaii to people in tents that were uh, celebrating a sales awards uh, conference or speaking in the middle of a mall in uh, Dubai that uh, was owned by the, uh, the ruler of the kingdom and who had invited all of his uh, UAE uh, ministers to hear me uh, to speak to the effectively their cabinet. And those kinds of experiences have been uh, fascinating to me and I've enjoyed and appreciated them greatly. But the other thing that I remember is what I learned because too often we go through life and we miss lessons. Things happen to us and unless we remember what we learn, then it's not really a lesson. It's just lost on us. And one of the things that's become increasingly clear to me is that we say that people all over the world are the same, and that's true. We are in a global economy. But what people don't understand is that even though I, while we share the same hopes and dreams and aspirations, the ways we go about achieving them are very different. Uh, there was a movie made in the United States about a uh, GM plant in Dayton, Ohio that closed and the plant was bought by a Chinese owner and it's a glass manufacturing plant. And it, the documentary was interesting to me because the American and Chinese uh, goals, their desires were the same, but the processes and the cultural differences that uh, they had to face prevented them sometimes from achieving those goals. So I think right now in uh, 2020 and beyond, really understanding not just all the things that people have in common, but the different ways that they go about achieving those things, that's going to be one of the great skills if you're a multinational or global leader. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective how you put it. And I think a lot of people will definitely benefit from this because you know, you've kind of seen it all, you know, with, with your experience. And over the years, um, you know, you've been uh, a propagator of leadership and leadership styles. So in your lifetime, have you seen leadership styles being morphed in different ways and, you know, with changing times and priorities? And what should essentially be the focus of leaders as we delve into an uncertain future? I get asked that question a lot. And up until the uh, crisis of the pandemic and COVID-19, the question usually was, what's changed most in leadership? And my answer is leadership hasn't changed that much, but what's changed the most are followers. Uh, the people we lead don't think of themselves as followers anymore. And we refer to leaders and followers, leaders being in charge and followers being on the team. But today, especially with younger employees, if you treat someone like a follower, you're really missing the point. You can program a computer to do a great number of things. And what you hire people to do today is to use their thought process processes to have both their head and heart invested in the work, which is something that so far computers can't do. So we have to treat the people we lead not like followers where we tell them what to do and they do it, but as collaborators and co-workers and colleagues and associates and team members because the important message here is that how you talk about the people you lead determines two things it determines how you treat them and it also determines how they respond 
the key to leadership is to engage people to achieving a common goal or objective, not just tell people what to do. And historically, there were times that people knew what to do, but they never understood the bigger picture of why they should be doing it or how it contributed to a successful outcome. And so that's changed very dramatically. I think people want much more autonomy in, in their work lives. Uh, they want to, to know what needs to be done, and they want the tools and resources to do it. But they want the latitude where it's possible to bring their own, uh, their own style, their own perspective, their own uh, unique uh, personality to the job being done. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, previously, and you must have seen this, you know, leaders and organizations and employees, they worked for, you know, the basic uh, earning capacity just to kind of be capable of earning. But now it's, it's shifting, not just from earning, but to have, you know, a valuable uh, higher order purpose, to really have a purpose for life. And in that sense, do you think... Uh, leaders have evolved from becoming very business centric to, you know, more of people centric and then empathizing with them and understanding them as people and not just, you know, uh, capital, what is that called? I believe successful leaders have had to make that shift. And it's a false dichotomy, this idea of people or profits, because people and profits uh, are intertwined in such a way that you really can't separate them. If you only produce results, if you only produce numbers, the people that you lead will dislike you. They may do the minimum amount to get by, but they won't be committed to you or to the company. If you only take care of your people, if you're only nice to people but don't deliver the numbers, you're known as a hail fellow or a good old boy or a good old gal or a nice person, but you probably won't be with that organization for long. And the single biggest tension that exists, in my opinion, in leadership is that tension between people and profits or people and results. And you've got to balance the two. You can't achieve one at the expense of the other, or you won't have a healthy enterprise financially or in terms of your employees. Um, leaders have really had to become very practical and realize that if you're only getting people to do what needs to be done because they have to, that's called compliance. And nobody ever really performs well when they're simply being compliant. Leaders get people to want to do what needs to be done. And that's, of course, commitment. And that's when we all do our best, work our best. And in my latest book, The Intention Imperative, I talk about three really important shifts that leaders need to pay attention to. And one of those three shifts is from motivation to inspiration. Now, motivation is good. It gives you a reason or a reward to do what it is you're being asked to do. And that reward can be intrinsic or extrinsic. Extrinsic. What we find here in the United States is that millennials, 84% of them, say they'd rather do important work that matters than be recognized by their employer. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't value recognition. It just means that recognition isn't enough. They don't want to spend eight hours a day or an entire shift doing something that really doesn't contribute to the greater good. So I call inspiration, motivation to the power of purpose. It's giving people the rewards that they need. They need to be paid. They need employee benefits and perks and time off. That's all still important, but it's all not enough. You've got to be able to tie that to a higher purpose, the greater good, whether it's for the customer or for the organization or for the community or for all three. And that's what the best leaders do. The best leaders inspire. They don't just motivate. That's a beautiful way to put it. You know, it's just not about motivating, but it's about inspiring. So, you know, would you say that, you know, we used to call leaders as managers before, and now the jargon is more towards being a leader and inspiring. So would you say that managers were good at, you know, like managing people and probably even motivate them to an extent, but now you have leaders who stand as examples who can ride through the storm and who can really inspire people and get them to do, to get them to kind of achieve an objective. I believe all leaders need to have good management skills, but unfortunately not all managers become good leaders. Uh, there are a number of differences, and, and I'm generalizing a bit in limited time, but for instance, uh, managers tell, but leaders sell. 
A manager tells what needs to be done, but a leader sells you on why that's important to you and to the organization. Uh, managers uh, form work groups, but leaders form teams. And a team, and regardless of what you call your work group, if you call it a team, the real test is, is that group more than they would have accomplished if they weren't working together? If you've got four people in a work group, you get the results of one plus one plus one plus one, four people. If that group is experiencing the synergy of teamwork, you should get greater results. One plus one plus one plus one should equal five, six, or seven, because synergy is the ability to help leverage each other's strengths, complement each other's weaknesses so that you get more done. I think most managers take credit, but I think most leaders give credit. I, I think that, uh, that leaders are the next level above management skills. Management skills are important. And I know a lot of people in my profession use management and leadership uh, interchangeably. I don't buy that. I think that you can be a good manager but not a great leader. I don't think you'll be a great leader if you're not a good manager. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with you on that one. And I think you have to be um, leaders and, and not managers. I think leader leading something gives you a higher order purpose. And I think the sense of gratification is higher when you can achieve something together with your team. And as managers, you might be good at micromanaging and, you know, help people do tasks correctly on time, but you're not really developing their mindset for success. And that could be harmful to the organization. So absolutely agree with you on that one. You know, we, we talked before uh, we started recording about this idea of a remote workforce, which of course COVID-19 has made us yeah. rely on by necessity. And the question is, you know, is that going to change the way we do business? And the answer is unequivocally yes, it already has. But let's just say that everything goes back to normal, hopefully sooner than later. Will people spend the same amount of time in their offices or will they spend more time remotely? Well, here's the question. And that is, are you focusing on how people do things or the results that they achieve? And in the past, management wanted people in one place for primarily two reasons. One, so they could oversee and control. And two, so that those people who were interdependent could collaborate with each other. Well, think about technology now. And of course, you know, whether it's uh, uh, WebEx or Zoom or any of the platforms that are popular, they make that collaboration possible, Slack and others. So no longer do we have to walk down the hall and sit in a room with the same people to collaborate. And in terms of control, what all good leaders control are results. And as long as what somebody is doing is meets the standards of the job being done and it's ethical and moral, I'm not that concerned with where they do it or how they do it. I'm concerned with how much they get done and how well they do it. So we're gonna, we, we've seen the two biggest impediments to remote working um, being basically solved by technology and new ways of thinking. There are still some jobs like manufacturing jobs that robots don't perform that are going to require people. There are still the, the great work being done right now around the world by first responders, whether it's in healthcare, or firefighters, or police officers. Those kinds of things are going to require they be present, although technology obviously is affecting all of those areas as well. But I think that if you're hung up on getting people to sit in a chair from eight until five every day, by the way, I, I've managed a number of employees and I know that you can be sitting in a chair working intently on your computer and doing nothing more than posting on Facebook. So the idea that by having people in the same room that they're productive, that's really kind of a, an archaic idea. Yeah, it's not just that, you know, if you have your team face to face with you, they're going to be very productive. It's not really that. You must find a way to, you know, measure performance. And that's kind of my follow up question to you is how should leaders measure performance of their team and then take a stance okay, you know, my team is doing well or take a stance that I need to improve. And what, what is that measure that you'd kind of, you know, look at? Well, it depends on the team, but you need a baseline or what I would call minimum required results. Those are results that are usually passed down if you're a middle manager from someone higher up. One of the great challenges, and frankly, there's no easy formula, is how do you know when you're asking your team to do too much or... Uh, here's another problem. Teams that are asked to do too little are more 
bored than teams that are asked to do too much. Teams that are asked to do too much might not be happy, but most people would rather be, have something to do than to be looking for something to do. So I, I think that it takes a great deal of both uh, intuition and insight into the capabilities of your team to know what that baseline minimum required work should be. I think anything that falls below that baseline, how, whatever metrics that you use, because I know the, the listeners today are, are, you know, very, are varied in the things, the jobs that they do in the industries that they do them in. But what you need to do is to make sure you're meeting at least baseline minimum required work. But then you should also ask yourself, if this is our goal, what's our potential? And a big part of my work says that if you achieve your goal, by the middle of the year, let's say you're a sales professional and you have a sales goal for the entire year 2020. If you achieve that goal by September 1st, what do you do for the rest of the year? Now, I don't care how motivated you are. There's what I call the problem of the security of an achieved goal. Once we achieve a goal, we relax. Now, that's not all bad because we can't stay wound tight 24 hours a day. But what I do think is that we should ask ourselves, not just are we achieving our goals, but are we pursuing our potential? Because I've never worked with any high level individual or any company that could tell me or prove unequivocally they have maximized their potential. Most of us are far underperforming our true potential. And that's kind of to me what makes business and sports and life exciting. And that is we get up in the morning and we don't focus as much on how good we were yesterday but we focus more on how good could we be today. Absolutely. So, you know, you know, all of these um, different kind of measurements we have, right? Like KPIs and OKRs. And, you know, we've got uh, systems that will tell you these are your goals and these are your team level and organization goals. Do you believe in all of that? Is that really helpful? Well, I, I do believe in measurement. You know, there's an old management cliche that, even though it's familiar, is true, and that is you measure what you treasure. Uh, first of all, you can have too many metrics. They, you know, and, and I'm not the expert, but leading indicators and lagging indicators are important because a lot of the things that we find out, you know, what our sales were for the last quarter are lagging indicators. Leading indicators are how many calls you're making and your close rate and your prospecting. And so the best way to manage results is by leading indicators that's the inputs, if you will, that give us those numbers that we desire at the end. Uh, the problem is, is too many metrics confuse people. Uh, when I'm a pilot, I haven't flown for many years, but I, I understand flying, and you have key instruments on your panel, and you monitor the most important instruments. Now, there are other instruments that are less important and that can give you information, but but your altimeter, your airspeed, uh, you know, your, your uh, ascent, descent, these are some of the key indicators. Now, I'll say that leaders need to ask themselves, what are the most important um, instruments or gauges on my dashboard? You need a leadership dashboard. And I can't tell you what they should be, but you need to know, are you performing in the most important areas? You'll have more than, more than five or six metrics, but you should have only five or six primary metrics and the other metrics should support them right yeah that makes a lot of sense otherwise that will cause a lot of confusion and that could lead to an individual getting more demotivated than being motivated right and and that can destroy careers as well so the balance has to be there and that's to be thought through and strategized uh, correctly. I agree with you on that one. And I'll, I'll share a story that's kind of sad. It happened many, many, many years ago, and I won't mention the airline or the airport, but basically uh, before uh, autopilots uh, were as sophisticated as they are today, if you pushed on, if you set your airplane, a commercial airliner on autopilot, you could disengage by putting pressure on, on, the, on, the, uh, the, jo on the, uh, the stick or pressure on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the controls and this airplane had a landing gear problem and while they were trying to solve the landing gear problem one of the pilots bumped the yoke which disengaged the autopilot the plane started to descend and in flying they call this task saturation they became so focused singularly on getting the landing gear down nobody noticed that they were slowly descending and literally they plowed into the ground without any warning because of this task saturation so if you're not paying attention to something like your altitude while you're looking at a lesser measure, 
you know, maybe a disciplinary problem versus the bigger picture, that same task saturation can, can be very, very bad, if not uh, lethal in your business as well. Absolutely. That makes sense. And what is your take on feedback? How do you, do you believe in critical feedback or do you believe leaders should do more of, you know, the positive feedback mechanism and should it be continuous or should it be managed annually or semi-annually? What is your take on that? Well, performance reviews primarily fail because they're retroactive. You know, they tell you what you've been doing right or wrong for the last six months. So I think that a performance review shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, Ken Blanchard famously, when he taught at Cornell, said, the beginning of every semester, I gave my students all the answers to the questions on the final exam. And uh, my, my fellow teachers and administration were upset and they say, why did you do that? And he said, because it's my job to make sure that they know what it is they're supposed to know. My job isn't to find out what they don't know. And I think in a way that's a great metaphor for what we should do. I call it feed forward and that is giving people the information they need now to be successful in the future. Uh, it doesn't mean there, there doesn't need to be feedback. Feedback is, is minor correction or reinforcement. There's, there's only two kinds of feedback, positive and negative. Positive says keep doing it, good job. Negative says stop doing it or do it differently. People need that information. But here's what makes feedback work or fail. Feedback should be focused on the performance, not on the person. Now, yes, I know the person is responsible for their performance, but it's the difference between saying, Mark, I don't like the speed at which you talk, and saying, Mark, you talk too fast. You see, the speed at which I talk is my performance. I control how fast or slow I talk. But if you say you don't like me, even before you get to the point that the reason for that is because I talk too fast, I get that not as constructive, but as criticism. I don't see that as feedback. I see that as something that's directed at me, something that's negative about me, not negative about what I do. So maybe the single greatest art in giving good feedback, any feedback, is to be able to be tough on the problem, but soft on the person to address the performance that's controllable and that can change, but to maintain the relationship you have with a person. And if you're a parent, this works at home too. You know, one of the hardest things about being a parent is having rules and boundaries while maintaining the relationship with the child. Uh, because if the child feels attacked, that you don't love or care for him or her, all the rules and boundaries in the world aren't going to work. You've got to maintain that kind of uh, relationship with them where you say, your value, your loved, this behavior needs to change. Right. That's an interesting take, how you connect parenting to leadership. And that makes a lot of sense also. And somebody interesting also told me that, you know, it should be more of high frequency feed forward and which would be, you know, low impact on the negative part of it because performance reviews are mostly, you know, they're low on frequency and they're high impact on the negative. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, that could really, really help out an individual's performance. And, you know, uh, we're kind of now in this turmoil and we're forced uh, to kind of work remotely. Do you think this is going to be the new normal? And how would leaders balance the need for employee welfare and safety with objective business approaches and the need for being in the office? Well, first, I'm very opposed to the phrase, the new normal. It's become a cliche, and, you know, normal is whatever happens. Uh, we have to be fairly agile. I know we want some sense of, of uh, certainty, but increasingly, we've got to be more agile than certain, taking new information and factoring it in. Uh, the new normal, here's why I'm against the phrase. I know what people mean, but if you think you found what normal is, you stop paying attention. You know, one of the things among many that we hopefully will learn from this pandemic is the stuff that we think can happen and that's really horrendously terrible but probably won't happen can still happen. And a lot of what happened, if it wasn't predicted, it was certainly on the radar. But we were distracted by doing other things that we thought were more important. And maybe at the time they were more important. What I think instead you have to do as a leader going forward is to realize that whether or not you know you work behind a desk or you're a technician in the field or you work from your home that the key to any day is to to have a routine or to have a a, a formula and as i've worked with a number of leaders now during this pandemic 
uh, I'll share with, with your listeners and viewers what I shared with them. Uh, first, the first thing that every effective leader and high performer needs is rest. And the one nice thing about the pandemic is most people, whether or not they take advantage of it, have more opportunity to rest. Rest keeps your immune system up. Lack of rest sometimes causes people to perform as if they're intoxicated. Extreme sleep deprivation has that ability. So the first thing you have to do is rest because in any crisis and situation, the primary responsibility of a leader is to take care of him or herself first so they can take care of their people. Now leaders may have to sacrifice more, may have to sacrifice first, but don't become so sacrificial that you think by getting sick and dying, you've done your team a favor. A good leader, takes care of him or herself first so they can take care of their team. So you need rest. Number two, you need routine. And when I get up in the morning, I have a routine. Uh, I, uh, I exercise every morning, six days a week, one day for recovery. Exercise is more effective, by the way, or as effective as, as uh, pharmaceuticals in dealing with some depression. And it's a way to keep, again, healthy, energized, your immune system up, uh, I also wake up in the morning and I have key activities that I do first thing in the day because that for me is the best time to do them. After I get through my routine, then I go to the third thing and that is problems. What are the most pressing problems that need to be solved? Not all problems are pressing. Not all problems need to be solved. But you need to have a sense of what's most important. Then number four, what are your projects? Do you have at least two or three things that you have identified that you are capable of and want to accomplish by the end of the day. Might not be a, a major goal, but projects are the subparts of goals and they keep us moving forward. So you got problems and then you've got projects. That's number four. Number five are relationships. And let me just tell you two things. One is some of the worst advice I've heard during the pandemic is that we have to over communicate. You know what? We're, we're so over communicated, we're not paying attention to anything. Companies that I didn't even know I used to do business with have emailed me to tell me how concerned they are in the part they're doing in the pandemic. And so now it's almost impossible to get people to open emails because so many are useless, low priority emails. What you need to do as a leader is not to communicate more. You may do that, but to communicate better. And better means that when you do communicate, you have something important to say, that there is a reason. And people are much more likely to open your email or take your call or your text or whatever means that you use when they know that it's going to be important. It's not about over communicating. That's a poor choice of words. It's about communicating better. And you do have to communicate fairly frequently because if people don't have information, they'll tend to make up their own. The second thing when it comes to relationships is good leaders always, especially in times of crisis, share the PIE, P-I-E, which is an acronym. And it'll help you remember. I know it's corny, but it'll help you remember. First, you got to bring people back to purpose. Because if people get discouraged about what they're facing day to day and lose sense of their, their, their purpose in the future, they become demoralized and give up. So you've got to continually remind people so that they stay purposeful. They know that the suffering, the inconvenience, the hard work, the changes are all for a greater purpose, whether that be personal and or professional. The second thing you've got to share are ideas, good ideas. I am in touch with about a half dozen or more friends that are very bright, that I trust, and we're sharing ideas, we're sharing books, we're sharing tips. These are the kind of people I know have done their research, they're informed, and I've learned uh, some things. I, I've learned uh, some things that I've done during this slower time for me as a speaker and author, specifically from people that shared ideas with me. And when I have a good idea, I try to share it with others. And then finally, the E in pie is for encouragement. People need to be affirmed. They want to know they're not in it alone, that somebody else remembers and cares about them. And I'm not talking about being gimmicky and just sending these comp affirmational little uh, bromides. I'm talking about taking time to check in with people and reminding them that they have what it takes to succeed. So one is communicate better, don't over communicate. And, and two is when it comes to relationships, uh, share the pie. And finally, the last thing is uh, recreation. Uh, you've got to make time to have some fun. You can't go, and, and, and I've seen doctors that are just going, they're superhuman. They haven't had time, can't recreate, but eventually they're going to have to because you need that, that downtime for entertainment. Hopefully, 
that recreation will be with your family and loved ones. So those are the ways to structure your day, especially in a crisis, but really any day if you want to be more productive and effective as a leader. Wow, absolutely. I think that is the crux of being productive in this time. And let me just summarize it for the viewers because I think this is important. So you talked about having, you know, sleeping well and then talked about a routine, a good routine that you start with your day. And then you talk about the problems that you need to address. You need to prioritize uh, which ones go first. Not all problems need to be solved. Uh, you spoke about projects, uh, have something to do during the day to complete some of them and then take on relationships, which is not over communicating. And that is a very different opinion than what I've been hearing all this while. And it, it really does make me think that we must communicate better than just over communicating. Uh, and, and that's food for thought. And the second part of it is that, you know, uh, you follow the pie, which is having a purpose and, you know, ideas, collaboration with ideas and uh, really upskilling and getting yourself to a different level. This is a good time to do that. And also encouraging to be, you know, just better people, encouraging positivity and uh, being in this together. And finally, recreation, which is basically having good downtime. Have I summarized that okay? No, you, you've, done, you've done great. Thank you. Absolutely. I think this is wonderful advice. And thank you so much for, you know, uh, kind of laying that out. I, I'm really sure it's going to help a lot of, uh, you know, viewers out there. And the next part of it is that what do you think about, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about gig economy and like you said, you know, millennials entering the workforce now. Uh, you know, there will be a lot of challenges for leaders as well to work, to be more inclusive. And do you think gig economy is now going to evolve, especially when you consider, you know, the growing ranks of millennials? Uh, you know, the, I'm an economist by training. That's what my formal education is in. And even though I'm not a practicing economist, I pay a lot. I pay close attention. We really don't know the impact uh, in our respective countries or globally that the pandemic is going to have on the economy, but they will be far reaching and they will not uh, come to fruition in the immediate future. This is a long term um, situation in terms of the impact that uh, the economy faces. I think the economy is, isn't changed as much by differences in generations as it is by differences in circumstances. For instance, a hundred years ago, uh, you know, you would not, you had an economy that would not have been able to withstand a pandemic uh, of swell. I mean, I guess you got the Spanish influenza in the beginning of the 1900s, but the kind of a, a, a pandemic we're having today might have been uh, totally changed uh, the economy. It probably would have survived, but it would have been very different than it is today. I just think we've got to be, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. We've got to pay attention and be very, very informed, super informed. Uh, we've got to realize nobody knows with certainty, you know, even the experts aren't going to get it all right. And we have to make the best decisions based on the information we have at the time and then be able to adjust or update the decisions we've made based on new information. And as vague as that is, uh, that's really the only practical way I think we have to go forward. Right, absolutely. We must be informed and just try to uh, kind of take decisions when you're you know, you have the right knowledge to make informed decisions and that will really help uh, all, all the business folks out there. Right. And, um, you know, lastly, to, to kind of end, uh, we've come to the end of the interview. If you'd like to leave any other important sound bites, uh, you know, for our viewers. Well, I hope uh, people who've enjoyed the time we've spent today will go to MarkSanborn.com, especially to check out my blog and videos, because my goal is to give people information they can use to be more successful in their personal and their professional lives. You know, I've been blogging specifically about the pandemic and leadership uh, uh, crisis, leadership right now. So that's at MarkSanborn.com. I have about 70 or 80 short videos. I'm in the business of sharing ideas because I guess I would end on this. Ultimately, whatever business you're in, whatever kind of customer you have, what they buy isn't a product or service. What they buy is the ability to be more successful 
to enjoy their life better, to reduce the problems and challenges that they face. And so if you frame what you do, whether you're a speaker or in healthcare or in law or in manufacturing or AI, if you ask yourself, how can I help my customer be more successful, you'll always have an admirable and a profitable goal in mind. Absolutely. Those are wonderful words. Thank you so much for that message. And it was a pleasure to talk to you, Mark. Mark bon, MarkSandborn.com. I'm definitely going to visit that. And I hope all our viewers do that too. I really, really appreciate your time, Mark. And you know, thank you so much for sharing your views with us. It's truly been an enriching experience. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you as well. And all the best. Thank you. Let's keep in touch and uh, stay healthy, stay safe.